I, I think a lot of my passion for this is knowing, and, and my mom always had gotten mad at me because I continue to beat myself up for it, was the fact that I chose... My, I chose a nightlife and alcohol and drugs over a film career. And I think what I just have been doing is just pushing so hard because, because the medium now, I mean, this is what we put movies on. You know, this is what we put the it's, it's not, it's not videotape anymore. I mean, we have, we can do things now because of these that we couldn't do, you know, when I was making movies, when you had to, <laughs> a three minute reel of, of eight super eight film, and that's what you had. Right. Um, and I think because of all of the stuff that we have access to now and, and how inexpensive the equipment is, I am just like, you know, I'm 20 steps ahead of myself because there's all these movies that I thought I've, I've thought of over the years that I just, that I'm like, okay, all right, let's do this one. Okay, fuck it. We're done with that. Let's do this one. Okay. You know, I mean, you, you've seen my lineup. I got four movies I want to do. Now I'm at the point now where I don't want to do them without money because I feel like I, the people that have been with me have worked for free long enough. So, sure. um, but as, as far as my life, anything that's fun, it, it's just because of chasing what, I feel I pissed away and my mother keeps telling, had kept telling me that you're good. You, you, you're good. You've, you've proved that you've cleaned up your act mm -hmm. long time ago because I quit drinking in 1989 and I'm close to 30 years of being clean and sober. And I still feel like I need to make up for what, I did in three and a half years. So where did Todd Ernest Braley grow up? Where, 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 where did you um, call home for your youth? Well, when I was, uh, we kind of moved around a lot when I was a kid, but I was born in Bay City, Michigan. And for those of you who don't know much about Michigan, here's Michigan. Bay City was right here. <laughs> so, and then uh, when, when I was probably five or six, we moved to Phoenix, Arizona. We only lived there for about a year. And then we, uh, from there, we moved to, uh, back to Michigan. And then in 1974, we moved to, uh, we moved to Diamond Bar, California. And that's where I, I lived in, in California from 1974 until I left there in August of 1999 to move to Colorado. Hey. What did, were your parents artists? What did your parents do for a living? You know what? No, my it's I'm I come from a really weird family. Um, uh, well, I'm not gonna say it's weird, it's just it's not what everybody else would perceive somebody that makes movies would come from. Um, I came from a uh, my dad was a carpenter, he was a union carpenter, he did that until literally like 10 12 years ago, he mm. retired then, and uh, my mom, uh, actually for a while, um, she worked, she was a, she was a secretary, you know, she worked for a few different businesses when we lived in Diamond Bar. And she, at one point in my existence, when I think, how old was I? 
I think it was a junior in high school when she got a job working for, now this is, here's where the entertainment part comes in. Nice. She, she was the, um, she was the production coordinator for the McDonald's production studio in the city of industry. Wow. And I got, I, I went down there quite a bit. I actually even got to use her office to shoot one of my first movies in, uh, that I, that I did. And, uh, we got to use the, there, there was a basement in this place where all the offices were at and we shot, um, a, uh, God, I can't even remember what, what the name of the movie was that I did, but we got to use the, her place for a police station, which was, which was really kind of cool. So yeah, she worked for the, for the McDonald's production studio. I met a lot of people, learned a lot of stuff. I learned about commercial production because there was a lot of, uh, they, they made a, obviously made a lot of commercials there. Uh, they did make movies there. They did, uh, Oh God, book two there. And they did, they did, uh, a, a, it was kind of an ET ripoff called Mac and me. They did that there. And then there was, I, I don't remember the name of it. There was a musical that they did there as well. But, um, but then they would also, you know, obviously they would do commercials, but then they also did, uh, training videos there. Hmm. And that is where I met Dom Deloise. And I actually got to have an hour long conversation with Dom Deloise because my mom called me up. She goes, Hey, Dom Deloise is here. He's, he's doing uh, training videos. You need to get down here. So I, <laughs> I was supposed to, I was home for lunch and I was going to college and I, uh, I didn't go back to school that day. I, I went down <laughs> and sat and Got to talk to Dom Deloise for an hour. So that was, that was pretty cool. So that, that was my introduction. I also did, uh, when I was in high school, I went to the Art Center College of Design over in Pasadena. They had Saturday classes and I used to take those. The, the classes you took in Pasadena, were they production classes or were they writing classes? It was actually a little bit of everything because what they would do is they'd, they'd kind of take different pieces of their filmmaking classes and put it into one class. And you did that for six weeks okay. and, you know, the classes were on Saturday, you'd go there, they'd start at eight o'clock in the morning and finish up around two o'clock in the afternoon. That's where I got my first introduction to a lot of films. That's when I got introduced to Martin Scorsese. I didn't, you know, I was, I was kind of an action movie guy and I was the Miami vice, you know, I wanted to make cop movies and I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to do Starsky and Hutch and Beretta and, and all those, for those of you who are young, and don't know those, look it up. <laughs> that shit's on IMDb. You'll find it. But then I, I started learning about, about people like Martin Scorsese and learning about the uh, about, more about how to make movies versus just shoot movies, you know, how the, the process and what as far as setting up shots, you know. And I had I had done a few things before then with with a couple of movie cameras that my grandmother had given me. I didn't get a full appreciation. Well, I still, at that point, still didn't have a full appreciation, but I was starting to learn to appreciate something other than, other than Starsky and Hutch. You know, that was, that was when I first saw Raging Bull, Citizen Kane, um, which I watch at least three or four times a year, even now at 53 years old. So those, those were the kind of things, you know, even though it was kind of cool because he would show us little bits of these movies and then we'd have to go and figure out how to find him because he he had actually when we watched Raging Bull he had a thirty five millimeter print of of it so we weren't watching it on video I mean we were watching a movie we were he had he had the the movie so he would bring in these different reels it wouldn't be the whole movie so we'd sit for twenty minutes and watch a couple of scenes and then from there I kind of uh, I kind of fell out of it for a little bit. And then uh, because I decided that women and being a DJ were more important than uh, than my film career, which which sucks because I I kind of pissed away a lot of opportunities that that not everybody gets, you know, and I kick myself for it now because, you know, during that that time period when I was a, a, a DJ, very popular DJ. I, you know, accumulated a, a good old fashioned alcohol and drug problem. And, and then uh, from there, when I, when I cleaned myself up, 
I kind of dove back into it. Uh, that being said, what, what age do you feel like you were starting to tell stories at? Were you very young or was it something that came along after the fact? Or do you feel like you might have been a storyteller early on, but you really didn't develop that until you started making films? Yeah, you know, I mean, I when I was a kid, before I had before I had access to movie cameras, I used to, I was super interested in animation. I, I think at seven years old, I was dead set that I was going to be an animator for Disney. Parents used to take us to go see, you know, the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, I saw that in the theater. Um, <laughs> and Snow White. Yes, I saw that in the theater. Um, Bambi and all those. So, you know, that's kind of what I had started aiming towards is doing that. And then as I got older, I started falling away from that more and more. Um, I found that I could write stories. When I was in the fourth grade, I wrote a pirate story that was probably like the only A I ever got when I was in school, my, my entire school existence. And my teacher just thought it was, his name was Mr. Enoch. And he was just like floored by this two and a half page story that I wrote when it was the, the assignment was, you know, three paragraphs and I went two and a half pages and had this pirate and on a ship and an octopus that attacked and had all this craziness. And he just, he just told me that I should, you know, I should keep writing. I should stick to writing. And then I really dug in when I started learning from Jim Pasternak and uh, took some classes. I actually made a movie uh, called Dark Side of the Mind. Now you've probably seen the posters for that now that factors back in later. But because of that movie, I met a gentleman named Jim Pasternak, who is now a uh, film teacher over at the LA Film School. And uh, he had he used to teach private classes. And I took, took classes from him. And that is when I learned about character development and writing and having a passion for filmmaking, not just wanting to be a filmmaker and get an Academy Award. Because I'm I'm at the point now where even though I use a lot and that's just somebody who told me it's a good PR thing. I don't like to use it, but you know, even though I'm an award-winning director um, awards don't mean anything to me so much as just making the movies and getting people to see them um, and making a couple of bucks off it along the way. I mean, a lot of guys are out there and they always, I always get shit for it. Uh, I, I don't do uh film festivals because we have such a plethora of platforms to get our movies out in it's almost I, honestly and and nobody the general public doesn't care about whether you've won an award or not yeah um for me you know i would rather have somebody watch my movie who wants to watch a horror movie like misfit or or one of my other ones then watch it because it's got an award on it uh, or an award attached to it. So, you know, I'm just, uh, I, I learned to appreciate movies and learn to have a passion for making movies versus wanting to be famous. And that's, I tell a lot of people that, and even up and coming filmmakers and actors, you know, do you want to be, do you want to be famous or do you want to, or do you want to work? So, uh, yeah, I mean, and I'm still learning, you know, and to me, if, if no no matter how how much further you get into your career if you're not continuing to learn about what it is that you do if you're, that you're doing and and things are changing you know almost daily sure. because of technology again starting to appreciate and learning about structure and learning about how to piece a script together and i i can honestly say that i have finally figured it out just over the last 10 years. You said about 10 years ago. So is that when it kind of clicked for you and you turned uh, this whole thing into the serious filmmaking career that yep. you have now? Or yep. was it a little bit before that? Or No, I'm ten, about 10 years ago. It was just because um, I had bought a... Uh, I was shooting a lot of wedding video because I was also a DJ. But I was, um, I was shooting a lot of wedding video because wedding video at that time where I lived was just... It was crap. You know, the people that were shooting it, there was one other guy that was doing a really good job of it. And um, 
so I, and I had, you know, I had moved here in August of 99 and Adobe, that's how far back we go. Adobe 3.0 editing system <laughs> was the newest version. <laughs> um, but I had learned to use that pretty well. And so um, I got my own software. I bought a Canon GL2 with the ever so lovely mini DV tapes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, still, I have drawers oh, wow. of, <laughs> of this stuff. But I was shooting, I was shooting uh, wedding videos and had kind of gotten out of the making movie stuff when I left California because I worked in Hollywood for five years. And that was probably the most eye-opening and depressing and fun and horrible experience of my life. Um, but when I came out here and when I was started doing these videos, I had a friend of mine had talked me into making a, a film that I had tried to make. Or I actually made a version of it when I was 18 or 19 with uh, my brother and a couple of friends. And then um, I had written a, uh, a, a script version of it, but never got it to where I really wanted it. Um, and then I saw Michael Mann's Heat and went, I can fix this script. And so I wrote it. This was when I was still living in California and I was working in Hollywood. I wrote the script and using my my script knowledge to put this script together and i think it was probably like 70 pages and then uh i had, had told a buddy of mine who was a photographer and i said about it and he was like dude he says we got because he had two of those gl2s <laughs> so we had three cameras and the shield was really hot at that time too and I was, and I was like, oh man, we should, yeah, we could do that. Well, he, he want, this was after he spent an hour and a half talking me into it. And then, um, so we got, we got it together, got some actors and went and made this movie, which, you know, it's kind of one of those that, that I watch and go, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> but then at the same time, I got my, I got my feet wet again. And that's when it came back in. And that was 2007. And then uh, I just kind of went from there, you know, I mean, I, 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 I was self-employed and I could pretty much do whatever I wanted at that point. Man. So I made this uh, movie China white. And then from there, um, you know, I just started thinking about what else can I do now? What else can I do now? And then I never really made another movie with the, uh, with the, uh, with the GL twos, with the mini DV tapes but then when I bought my first, bought the Sony NEX VG10, um, and that's when these came into play, I went, okay, now it's fucking game on. And and then it was, that was 2008 or 2009. And I just went ape shit, And I haven't stopped, literally haven't stopped since. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We had an awesome first day, an absolutely awesome first day. Um, we, uh, we shot quite a few scenes. We still have a few more that uh, we're going back to our location tomorrow to, uh, to get shot. But um, we, had, we had an amazing day, man. Our, our talent, our actors are off the chain. I mean, they are just really awesome. So, um, yeah, I just, I'm really excited. I'm going home to look at the dailies right now. And um, we will be uh, posting. I don't know if you guys saw the live uh, video that I did earlier. And uh, while we were shooting one of our scenes. And action. Stop. Okay. Don't open your eyes. 
seconds. Okay. On the count of three, two? open your eyes. One, two, three. You did all this yourself? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. Come on. <laughs> um, probably won't be able to do a whole lot of that here uh, coming up in the future just because we just have a lot of a lot of stuff to do and some of the days we are actually gonna be blowing through like 15 scenes in one day, so it's gonna be a lot of work. So anyway, I just really want to thank um, everybody who helped us out and um, I want to thank uh, the uh, you know start with our makeup it's six so yeah, I gotta go, change. go change that and do me a favor Elizabeth yeah if you want me to do my hair or something I can put it in a let's, twist up yeah let's do something a little different with your hair and I add add a little bit more makeup like I can actually have colored lips this time. Yes, let's go with that. Awesome. Because that that before that is what we had um, when we talk about well because you're wearing more makeup. Yeah. All right. I'll go sit with Cal. Okay. I'll be back in a minute. The makeup looked great. All of our actresses, Elizabeth and Bree, Maddie and Emily, were awesome. Uh, Nick did an amazing job as well. And then we had Ethan. Ethan had a couple of short scenes that he uh, that we did with him today, but he'll be doing a lot of his, the meat of, of his scenes tomorrow. And then my lovely wife, Angie, she was great. We had a couple of extras show up today and uh, we had um, Anna and uh, Becky and they did an awesome job of, uh, doing their stuff and then towards the end of the day Becky became Slate Girl so uh, she was having some fun there but we have a solid movie man I mean I, I I always feel good about the movies that we do but I'm gonna say that we have a solid movie I mean everybody did an amazing job I just wanted to share that with you guys and uh, just know that silence is underway. Yeah, you know, work of God. Sean, don't get him started. Come on, I thought we were here to play poker. You misunderstand me. I believe it was an act of God because Jeremy is God. Well, in a manner of speaking, anyway. And the blue ball silent at the table. Uh, <laughs> what? Cards. Cards, cards, cards. Heal the fucking cards. How on earth do you believe Jeremy is God? In any form. It doesn't matter because we're not talking about this. Action. Begin your pre-production process. What's the first thing that you do? As far as the the pre-production, I mean, once we get the script put together, I start looking for actors that um, that are all local. You know, I look for people that maybe that are that are hungry. 
that mm -hmm. want it, that want to do this. And so I'll hit them up first. You know, mm -hmm. I'll hit them up and say, you know, look, I want to do this movie. And that's how come, I mean, I, I start making posters. Somebody gave me, somebody gave me a bunch of crap because I was making posters before I had a script for something. And I'm like, well, isn't that part of promotion? Right. Don't you want to get people wired up for something that you haven't done yet? You know, I mean, I got, I, I forked out a lot of money to get those blood loss posters put together. And yeah, we don't have the money for the movie yet, but people know about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and people know that we're going to make it. I just I hit up actors and then start figuring out shoot dates. I break the script down, try to get, you know, try to figure out how we're going to, you know, when we're going to shoot, how we're going to shoot, how much crew we're going to have or going to need. So, I mean, it's it's just and then, you know, you get your locations and then uh and then you just jump in and start doing it. So once we have everything lined up, and I try not to put them off too much because once you get a, once you get the ball rolling, if you slow down, and I know this because it's happened to me, and Misfit Two has been put off four times now. Yeah. And um, but there's a possibility it may get put off again because of uh, somebody that I'm bringing on board that is probably going to be able to get us some funding so i don't know about you but i don't give a shit about putting something off a little bit longer if i'm going to have the green to make the movie right so sure. I'd rather i would rather push it and get that money than try and start it when you've got nothing yeah. you know it, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of footwork it's a lot of phone calls it's a lot of facebook messages it's a lot of instagram posts it's a lot of facebook posts you know yeah um, and then, uh, like when we were shooting Silence, we lost our hospital location four times after it was booked. <laughs> when you don't have any money, it's, it's you know, people, people will commit to a point. Yeah. And then, you know, well, I can bail out of this or I don't have to let him shoot here because he didn't give us any money. Fuck yeah. it. You know, so, and I get it, you know. Welcome to low budget or no budget filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> but then you have to, but then what you have to do is, is adapt because I've lost locations on the day of that yeah. we were supposed to go shoot. And, and that's when no budget us. filmmaking becomes guerrilla filmmaking at that point, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> let's figure it out. I mean, we were shooting Jeremy's a few weeks ago. We didn't have that. We wound up not having any access to a hospital room. So I don't know about, I think you probably saw the pictures. Yeah. I turned my kitchen into a hospital room. You know? <laughs> Took all the took all the pictures down. Got a a, a, a shower curtain. I bought a uh, a uh, fluorescent light for eight bucks. Hung it on the wall behind him. Got out our computer. Went on YouTube and found <laughs> found uh, some uh, uh, monitor uh, the uh, what you call it the uh, the heart monitor and stuff. The heart monitor thing. Yeah. And downloaded that onto onto a thumb drive, set up a computer screen, and boom, 
it's it's all being able to think on the fly sometimes if you have to. What did you do in Hollywood? Were you writing? Were you PA? No, I actually, I worked in a post-production. I, I was trying to get, obviously, I was trying to get into Hollywood. And yeah, sure. you don't get in without knowing somebody. I was lucky enough that I, I talked my way into a post-production facility and uh, lied a little bit about my abilities, but I didn't, I didn't go in as an editor. Um, I went in as a production assistant, you know, I was a peon at this post-production facility, but that, but being in that, in that facility, you know, you, you had access to everybody and their mother that walked in the door. Sure. Um, I was learning a lot about post-production and, and how that end of it runs. And I went from there, that used to be Veritel Video, then it was EDS Digital Studios. And then I left and went to uh, Hollywood Digital, which was right off of uh, Sunset and Coanga. And I was with them on, just until before Tadeo bought them out and then shut the doors. <laughs> but I worked over there then, I, was, I wound up being the overnight daily supervisor and um, I was responsible for getting the film from the labs for television shows like JAG, Nash Bridges, a bunch of the different uh, Nickelodeon channel movies. And we had, the movies that we had were Night at the Roxbury and Patch Adams, Armageddon, Horse Whisperer. We were doing stuff for Titanic. And then we also housed the post-production team on the second floor for the uh, HBO From the Earth to the Moon series that was going on at that time. You know, there was there was just uh, uh, John Milius. For those of you who don't know who John Milius is, he was the director. He did Conan, the Barbarian, the original one. And he helped write uh, the uh, Apocalypse Now and Red Dawn, the original Red Dawn, not that shitty remake. And, you know, just look him up. I mean, John Milius was just amazing. He was doing Rough Riders at the time when we were there and when I was working there. And so I got to sit down and have a chat with him for an hour and a half. Um, I got in a lot of trouble for that, but it was one of the coolest hour and a half, you know, conversations next to my Dom Del Louise conversation. So it, it was, it was a very educational and very depressing time because the cutthroat mentality of that town was just, I mean, I got blacklisted because I pissed off the wrong person and not for any other reason outside of just doing my job. So when I got fired, I thought, um, because my boss was very, <laughs> my boss had an ego the size of Texas and thought his sh shit didn't stink. And he was considered the golden boy where I worked. And when he, uh, when somebody made a comment, better watch out, Todd's going to be the golden boy here pretty soon, because I was always trying to come up with new ways to streamline things, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, I, I came up with a whole new system for, uh, for when we got the dailies, because I would go in at nine o'clock at night, and sometimes wouldn't leave till 12 o'clock the next day, making sure that these dailies got through and got color corrected, and they were dumping everything back to tape. <laughs> and getting those to couriers and getting them back out, you know, because on the Horse Whisperer, we were sending stuff to Northern California. That's where Robert Redford was shooting that. And then, of course, with Nash Bridges, you know, they were shooting daily on their for their episodes. And so I had to get stuff up to them. We are, we are also doing stuff for Hope Floats, uh, the Sandra Bullock, Harry Connick Jr. movie. So it was very, I learned a lot about the industry, but I also learned how fucked people are. Does your editing background give you a leg up in terms of shooting wise? Are you somebody who edits the camera or, or because of your editing background, are you somebody who overshoots, maybe does a lot of cutaways and things like that to have coverage? Somebody, I, I don't remember who it was that said, and it was, it was an interview that I heard. I think it was with Orson Welles that said there are very few filmmakers out there that see what they're what they're going to shoot. Yeah. Um and there there are some guy and I know a friend of mine um is one of those guys that he doesn't know what he's doing until he gets in the editing room. So he just shoots whereas well, I I make a shot list on my on my 
script, but I don't, let me see if I got a, an example. Yeah, here we go. So like on this, I'll hold it up. You tell me if you can see it or not. On that, you can see over here on the, on this side that I have the shots, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where I'm going because more often than not, even though I have a shot list, I have more or less, that's another, and that's why when people say, oh, I'd love to help you do storyboards. Well, no, because if you do storyboards for me, um, they're going out the window <laughs> because, and that's how, you know, people give me shit about that too. That Well, how come you don't storyboard? Because I'm, when you get to the set, you look, and then all of a sudden, even though if you've been there before, now you have bodies and now you look and you go, that's not going to work. Right. That's not going to work. <laughs> that's not going to work. As long as you got some basic outline and I've got something going on up here, I'm good. But I don't, you know, when I get ready to shoot, it's all done. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, it's already it's already shot. And action. Oh, yeah. Well, Shut the fuck up. Oh. Touch any of my friends and you will wish you'd never been fucking born. You hear me, you stupid bitch? Squeeze harder. Okay. <laughs> so I shoot enough of what I need. But I don't necessarily shoot, you know, I because I've done, I've shot, I've shot projects and even like, you know, I, I make TV commercials and stuff. I've shot stuff where I didn't shoot enough. Yeah. And then I sit down and I edit. Now I've made that mistake, you know, a few years back. Sure. And now I shoot what I need and maybe a little more. Yeah, that's awesome. But I, but I don't, I don't go crazy and have miles of footage to go through. And I also like to shoot multiple cameras at once. You know, yeah. I mean, we'll shoot three or four cameras. Um, we did a scene for silence. We had eight cameras rolling. Wow. Uh, because we only wanted to do one take. Wow. So we had eight cameras going. It sounds like one tough edit. Trying it, to it, it actually, it, it was tough, but I was glad that I had all sure. of that footage because one can everybody had something they had to shoot yeah it wasn't like random all over the place it right. was it was you're shooting her reaction you're shooting those two and their reaction you're on caitlin on the floor you're on caitlin's hand this is going to be the wide shot and then i had a camera on the on the crane that was right over the top of 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 our main character and Every every shot had a purpose. So when I got in there, I knew what I had. It wasn't like a bunch of random, you know, panning all over the fucking place and nobody, you know, because nobody knew. Everybody knew your camera's on her, your camera's on her. Well, what if I get him in the shot? I said, then fucking adjust. <laughs> you know, I mean, because we literally had cameras around the whole room. Wow. Maybe. And so, but, you know, I cut it together that you never knew that there were eight cameras rolling at once. Nice. Now, was there ever a scene that you were shooting at or you were constructing that you looked at and said, this is never going to work. We'll shoot it, but it's never going to work. And then you got back, you saw the daily and you were happily surprised it did work. Yeah. That scene that we just shot that, that I was just talking about. Yeah. Um, I had a, an idea of what I wanted it to be. And then when I sat down to cut it together and it had nothing to do with the footage, it just, the people, and, and this was kind of the opposite. You know, I looked at it and I was watching and I was like, okay, boom, we're good. We got everything we needed. It was when I sat down to cut it together that I went, oh, fuck, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. This yeah. is not, no. And I even had to bring my, now my wife who doesn't have a filmmaking background, who never made movies or had anything to do with movies before she met me, she is kind of like my eye. And she is the one that I run to to look at my stuff because she will not pull any punches nice. at all. If she likes it, she will go, you did good. Or she'll cry or she'll whatever, you know, the whatever the emotion winds up being of what I'm showing her or she'll tell me it sucks. 
Nice. In those words. <laughs> That's awesome. You need you always need that, right? You always yeah. need you, you have to. Better. And you have yeah. to be willing to take that criticism sure. as a filmmaker. You know, if you're if you're if you're in this industry and your skin is, you know, paper thin, get the fuck out because yeah. you're not you won't survive. Yeah. You won't survive. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was one of those things that I that I started cutting it together and I called her in. I said, I don't know what the fuck to do with this thing. It's not coming out the way I saw it originally. And so she threw a couple ideas at me and I sat down and it, you know, it took me about three and a half hours and I, I kind of milled through everything and came up with something that I still wasn't necessarily happy with mm. until I started showing people that were there. And when their reactions started to be like, <gasps> Oh my, okay, okay, stop it. Just stop it. Just stop it. Then, yeah. then you did something. Then then you wrote, then you then you go, okay, all right. I did my job. I'm good. How did you go into the horror genre? Was that just something you loved so you wanted to uh go into it a little bit or was it something that just happened? How how did you get involved with doing mostly horror? Horror unfortunately is something that makes money. Hmm. I mean, that is like the one thing that anybody and everybody will watch and that's not to that's not to you know slap the horror genre at all um i love horror movies but i'm an old school horror guy i love the original halloween the original friday the 13th you know once we got past you know three or four of them i i i was kind of done because you know, <laughs> it started to get stupid the horror genre was not where i wanted to go but it found me there because, or I found myself there because of more people will get, will watch it, you know, whether they like it or hate it, they'll watch it. When we did the original misfit, somebody uh, had offered to give us some money to do that. We jumped on it myself and, and some other people jumped on it because, you know, we thought we had this money mm -hmm. and, so it was, you know, it was about 5,000 bucks. And if you've never had any money to make a movie, 5,000 bucks is a lot of fucking money. Yeah. You know? And so we did it and we, we got it done for about $2,500, you know, out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And then when it came time, we got it done, we got it finished. And we went to the guy that was supposed to give us the money. And he said, well, we didn't get the deal that we thought we were going to get. So there's no money. Mm. So basically then what I did just from there, we just went ahead. We threw it up on Amazon. Tonight, the city is under attack by what police are calling the Haystack Killer. The serial murderer claims his victims by using a hay hook. The Haystack Killer has claimed 10 lives so far, including a family of four. As the manhunt continues, the chief of police had these words.
somebody, a friend of mine, uh, Brian T. Shirley, talked me into uh, entering a film festival that he's a part of. Um, and the only reason I did it was because I didn't have to pay anything to get into it. And I wound up getting a distribution deal with Shammy Media Group um, out of it, uh, or SMG, SMG Distribution. And they, uh, they started distributing the film. I mean, I already had it online and we, we'd done okay with it. You know, we had done okay with it on Amazon. And even when somebody watches it, if they have Amazon prime, you still get paid for it. There's, you know, it's not as much as if they rent it. So if they rent it for two ninety nine or three ninety nine, you know, you get 40% of that, but you know, we had done, we had done okay. I mean, you're not going to get rich off of it, but you know, we at least were able to, to get some of the money back okay, and sure. get some of the people like, you know, the special effects guy, we, we got quite a bit of money back to him, you know, not all of it, but we got him some money for the stuff that he forked out. And so when I, we did misfit, I was, you know, I was, I was kind of like done. I was like, okay, we did that. We're good. Went on and we did the, did kill show. Mm. And that was actually an accident. That wasn't even a movie that that wasn't even something we were planning on making, except my daughter, who's a makeup and effects, you know, dabbler. She made these, uh, she was in the bathroom one night. Sometimes she just gets like these creative whims and she'll just like leave the room. And then all of a sudden she'll come back out and, you know, she's got a slit wrist or she's got a nail embedded in her, in her forearm or something like that. And she came back out dressed as this kind of scary ass clown. And we kind of, I, I grabbed my camera and we started doing a, we, I started taking some pictures and before we knew it, two hours later, we were doing a photo shoot in the house and she just kept doing more stuff, kept putting blood. Oh, let me get this knife. Well, yeah, lick the knife. So she put the knife up and lick it, put some blood in the sink and then put your hand down there. So, you know, and of course my wife's looking, oh my God. <laughs> but Kill Show came out of came from that. In your mind's eye, what are a couple of scenes that you've written that you've gone, oh wow, that's awesome. I can't wait to I can't I can't wait to shoot this. One of the scenes that we did for Silence was a uh, it's just the the father and the main character Caitlin at the cemetery talking to uh, their the, the the dead spouse and mother it's it's written as this is something that happens on a yearly basis so this is not a new occurrence because it's something that they do but the father is having such a hell of a time you know it's been 13 years since his wife passed away and he just can't get past it at all you know the daughter and 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 you know in real life not everybody gets over the death of a spouse or a child or a parent yeah sure um, or a grandparent. And so we, um, when I wrote this scene, I was sitting on the couch and, and my wife, Angie was sitting next to me. And as I'm typing this out, I started crying myself. Mm. And, um, she looks at me and she goes, Oh my God, what's the matter? And I just, I, I said, I just give me a minute. <laughs> and so I just kept typing it. And about 10 minutes later, I finished it up and I'd been working on it for, I don't know, maybe an hour. And then I handed it, I handed her the laptop and I said, okay, you, you can read this now. And she started reading it and then she's in tears. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, when I, and this was, you know, five years ago when we wrote that script. And when we got to shooting it, we did exactly what we set out to do. When we showed it at the premiere a couple of weeks ago, there wasn't a dry, and, and I'll mind you, this is only 20 minutes into the movie. I mean, I had people crying throughout that entire film, which means, yes, I did what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole theater was, was in tears. And I was like, Ugh.
where does characters in your story start to take shape? Where do you feel like they really start to to round out for you? I I try to figure out who everybody is and what their what their point in the story is before I start writing the script because mm -hmm. I feel like <clears throat> you know I'll I'll go back to this uh I'll go back to I'll I'll refer back to Heat every single time because for for anybody who's never seen that movie or never thought of it in this way I was blown away by that movie when I saw it in the theater Michael Mann gave every single one of those characters an existence. Yep. They were not some throwaway character that when shit started to go south on both sides, you felt bad for Val Kilmer. Yeah. He was, he was the bad guy. Yeah. But you felt bad for him. What are some of the scenes that you, fans want to talk to you about most often? Everybody has their movie that they like, whether it's Kill Show or Misfit or Rain or The Confession. It kind of depends. More often than not, people just want to ask, how long did it take? What did you, you know, what did you do to do that? The basic generic movie watcher questions. Not that those are bad, but there's never, I don't get into like the psychological, I'm not one of the. I'm not one of those filmmakers that go, this is what my movie was about. <laughs> just really, just really try. I don't do that shit. To me, it's like, look, I had this movie I wanted to make. If you got something out of it like that, hey, more power to you, you know, but I wasn't going there. I, that's, that's just not, I want to, I like to tell stories. And to me, if when they're done, if you like them, cool. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I did my job. <laughs> if you don't like them, cool. You watched it. I got your money. And we'll move on. That being said, what does every Todd Ernest Braley film have to have? A twist. Ah. I will never, ever say that I'm anything like this, but I, I have more, more often than not, people have told me, I love your Alfred Hitchcock twists. There will never be another Alfred Hitchcock. I will never say that I'm Alfred Hitchcock, but that's one thing that I love about his movies. There's got to be a twist in there. It doesn't matter what it is. I always want the audience to go, oh, fuck, no, he didn't just go there. You know? <laughs> I'm trying to do this less and less, but my wife is, is always, <laughs> my wife has always said, why does everybody have to die in your movies? And I'm like, well, because you did you expected them to live do you love being an indie artist i do because i don't play well with others <laughs> <laughs> i've seen some filmmakers that have gotten you know gotten what what everybody considers to be their break and then where they were making movies hand over fist now they're waiting for somebody to give them a green light yeah i'm okay if i'm never rich from it i'm okay if i'm never famous from it as long as when i drop over that i've got well, i got to tell all the stories i wanted to tell i'm good i just would rather just go and make my movies and and make a couple of bucks off of them than be famous because i've seen what fame does i've seen what and I've experienced it, you know, when I was a DJ, and I actually have a script for this. So if anybody's got $10 million, come and talk to me. Somebody asked me one time what it was like to be a DJ back then. I said it was the closest thing to being a fucking rock star that you could that, that you could get without playing an instrument. And I've kind of run that fame line in a sense. You know, granted, the whole world didn't know about me. But I'll guarantee if we would have had the internet back then, motherfucker, you would have known who I was. But I was, you know, the, the kind of DJ that I was, I was just not somebody that stood up there and played records. I performed, I entertained, I was an MC. And that was fun to a point. And then it became, a, a, it, it was a, then it was a hindrance. Then it was, it was very, uh, it was lonely. It was extremely lonely. And you got to fill in that gap. You got to fill in that lonesome gap and cocaine and 
alcohol and speed and women and you know that'll only that'll fill that gap for an hour two hours it's not a real gap either right it's not real no it's not it's not we have got so many outlets you know i've said this earlier but we have got so many outlets for people to see our stuff you don't need to be a fucking studio director anymore you don't need honestly i mean i got those distribution deals but i'm not it's it's not nobody paid me any money up front for it i'm still waiting on checks yeah so distribution deals are not as important as they used to be granted you'll you'll wind up in walmart okay wow whoopee fucking do i was excited because i thought misfit was going to be in walmart now it never wound up in the store it was on walmart.com it was on target.com it was on best buy you can get it on amazon but in the end To me, success shouldn't be about where you, where your movie winds up because it can be anywhere. For a couple extra bucks through Distriver, you could be on every platform known to man. Yeah. And for $2,000, you can be on Netflix, you can be on Hulu, you can be on all of, you know, iTunes, you can be on all those because you're paying somebody else to put you there. Yeah. And that's okay because they don't get any kickbacks. You're getting all the money from it, but you're just paying them to do that for you. Right. How, how can you argue with that? Why do you need to have Lionsgate pick up your shit? And with social media, you don't need an advertising network. You have a free advertising network. Boom. For everything bad that Facebook is or Instagram or any of them, there's that. Yeah people will go oh well he's just he's anti-establishment he's this and that i'm like no i just want to fucking make movies even though my mom was in the industry she always thought that i needed to do what my dad did and my dad thought i needed to do what he did and i didn't